Welcome to the Block and Tackle Show, hosted by Carl Block. Carl is a partner in the law firm of Loeb & Loeb here in Los Angeles, California. He will be tackling some of the biggest issues in business today. Listen, learn, and enjoy as he leaves no stone unturned during deep conversations with some of today's most amazing business leaders. Welcome to the show. Welcome to today's episode of the Block and Tackle Show. I'm your host, Carl Block. Today, we have a really impressive guest, Evangelos Samudis, who is going to talk to us about artificial intelligence. And believe me, there just aren't too many people who have his depth and breadth of knowledge in this space. Evangelos is a recognized expert on new mobility and artificial intelligence. He's worked in Silicon Valley for decades as a venture investor, senior advisor to global corporations and governments, as an entrepreneur, corporate executive, and technologist. He's the co-founder and managing partner of Synapsis Partners, Synapse Partners, a firm that invests in early stage startups and developing enterprise software AI applications. He also advises global corporations on AI and mobility. In addition, Evangelos is the author of three books, including The Big Data Opportunity and Our Driverless Future. He's also written two other books, Transportation Transformation, and his latest book is The Flagship Experience. Evangelos, in his spare time, is also a member of Caltech's advisory board, the advisory board of Brandeis International School of Business, the advisory board of the U.S. Department of Transportation's Connected Cities for Smart Mobility Center, and the advisory board of Securing Future Energy. Not surprisingly, he has a PhD in computer science. Evangelos, welcome, and thank you for coming on the, the Block and Tackle show. Oh, pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation. It's great. And, and as you know, I, I could have actually spent five or ten minutes talking about your bio. You actually are an incredibly accomplished person, and we're grateful to have you. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is mobility AI. And... It's interesting because when I talk to people who are not immersed in AI or tech and I say, what is mobility AI? They think we're talking about smartphones. So it would be great before we get into some of the hardcore unpacking of the substance, if you would just generally give our audience from the high level, tell us what mobility AI is about. So over the past few years, um, we've we've seen this new trend emerge of new mobility. And new mobility typically refers to the use of multimodal movement, uh, movement of people and goods, um, using uh, what are called new energy vehicles. So vehicles that may be battery electric or hydrogen or, uh, or other, uh, have other novel powertrains. Uh, increasingly, these vehicles are intelligent and they have varying degrees of driving automation. So we, we are very familiar now, at least in some cities, with the fully autonomous vehicles uh, and uh, maybe other forms of moving robotics. Uh, but we also have uh, cars with lower levels of driving automation. Now, all of these um, movement, uh, whether it is, as I said, using a, a vehicle or, or doing something else relating to mobility, uh, increasingly is driven by AI. So um, uh, AI plays a, a big role in, in mobility, whether it is, as I said, the movement of people or whether it is the movement of goods. So in that vein, there are certainly some car enthusiasts who may know a little bit about the idea of autonomous vehicles and maybe uh, the safety features that are on existing vehicles. But ultimately, where do you see mobility AI going in transit? Do you think we're going to just have a nation of autonomous vehicles? Well, we're already... Uh... I think we will see autonomous vehicles in in a variety of environments, and I'll mention a, a couple in a minute. But 
Um, if you think of the, the new vehicles that are being sold by automakers such as GM, uh, Toyota, uh, Ford, and, and others, uh, uh, European automakers as well, uh, they have uh, what's called level two, level three uh, driving automation. That means that in, in certain environments, uh, the, the driver can um, let, uh, let the vehicle do the driving while they continue to pay attention. That's the level two, level two plus. Uh, we also, I mean, Tesla started that with their uh, autopilot and moving into full, uh, full self-driving. But now other automakers have exactly the similar capability. Increasingly, um, we will be moving from uh, letting the, the vehicle do some driving while we pay close attention to letting the vehicle do the driving, any driving environment without us paying any attention. Now, that, that's several decades away, if you will, but that's where, where we are moving with regards to, uh, to driving automation and, and all of that is based on AI. So, and, and if that happens in a few decades, we literally might not have real drivers anymore. Well, you know, I think that there might be scenarios uh, where uh, we will, somebody who is being transported will not want to drive. So, for example, um, we have talked to several people who can think about under certain, you know, once they feel safety about the safe in, in the vehicle that they that has that kind of capability uh, not driving during the, or not not having control of their vehicle during their commute uh, times uh, but on the other hand if you want to take a, a spirited drive uh, around the, with a, on a windy road in the let's say the the, the back areas of Napa Valley uh, you should you will be able to do it Right, and you should be able to uh, to do it. Uh, there's an interesting question that comes up in terms of if we uh, if we have these autonomous vehicles, uh, will our driving skills degrade? Um, and this is a question, by the way, that is being asked more broadly around AI, as as we have more intelligent systems uh, coming into into our into the tasks that we execute daily writing an email or um, planning or writing some code in the case of software engineers or whatever, um, will we, we will lose that skill set. Um, I, I think we may have some, in some situations, people may lose some of, of certain skill sets relating to that overall capability. But uh, as we've seen in the past uh, from from in the past where technology was incorporated into our daily existence, uh, whether it is the, the typewriter or, or other uh, technologies, we have not lost our ability to, to perform certain things. We're just being aided uh, in performing uh, the, the corresponding tasks. That, that makes a lot of sense. Although it is interesting that the more autonomous the vehicle is, and the more um, safety features there are, one would think that, for example, insurance companies would be pretty excited about that. And you know, you might have these the two tensions. These vehicles may be so sophisticated that there, if there is an accident, it might be more expensive to replace the car or the parts. But on the other hand, you might have a situation where the safety is unbelievable, and we cut down on the number of automobile hazards. So you, you're bringing up a couple of very interesting points here. So let's let's try to, uh, to, take, to take them one at a time. So um, insurance companies are indeed uh, particularly interested in the in drivers using uh, the automated using carefully and using appropriately the uh, automated features which are safety related for uh, in their vehicles. And um, as, I, as I talk about in my, in my new book, The Flagship Experience, um, insurance companies would like uh, 
um, to would like to share would like drivers to share data with them so that they can provide them with discounts this value exchange that exists between driver and an insurance company so from the perspective of safety and how the safety impacts your insurance rates um, insurance companies are all for these uh, new vehicles that, that have these uh, intelligent uh, features However, the other point, the other part of your question was uh, how is this, the new, how is manufacturing being impacted by the new vehicles? So what we are finding, and I will say that Tesla has made many of these innovations, but even our own portfolio company, Divergent 3D, which is down in, in Los Angeles, is making a lot of innovation, manufacturing innovations uh, in that, in that uh, way. The, uh, these innovations have the ability to reduce the manufacturing costs, as again, as I said, as Tesla has first demonstrated. But um, because of the way the vehicles are manufactured, the repair costs become much higher. So insurance companies now are starting to, I think, analyze very, very deeply uh, what it means to have a, a vehicle uh, manufacturing the way it is uh, when, for example, an ac even a small accident may require a very expensive repair. So, so that, that's the, so on the one hand, they like the, the new vehicles for the safety they provide. They don't necessarily like the new vehicles when they get into an accident for the repair costs that they require. But the that, that that's a great analysis. I would say the silver lining is the other thing that you touched on, which is data. And so, you know, certainly years ago and quite prevalently today, if somebody is in an accident it's the manual low-tech process of taking pictures taking notes um, sending it to the insurance company and sorting it out but with these vehicles the manufacturer and the insurance company will be able to get data we're having these number of accidents with this thing and so then the question will be does that actually help the manufacturer modify uh, you know, new versions of this vehicle much more rapidly and much more easily because they literally have the data on what causes the accidents or how the accidents occur. Yeah. So uh, the new vehicles and um, the, the so-called software defined vehicles that are starting to be introduced in, a, in the market, you know, we started with vehicles like Tesla, but now even uh, vehicles like the Ford Mach E, um, the, the BYD vehicles in Europe, the certain uh, Mercedes and, and Audi vehicles, these are so-called software defined. They're called software defined because software plays a much different role in the, um, in the capabilities of the vehicle, in the architecture, in the features that it has, in, in, in how, it is, uh, how it is demonstrated. Um, so, in the, the soft, these software-defined vehicles uh, tend to be big data generators. And uh, they're big data generators because they are laden with various uh, sensors, uh, cameras, LIDAR, radar, you know, whatever. All of these sensors um, have been introduced primarily in order to, uh, to enable the vehicle to both protect itself and its occupants but also to be able to move uh, increasingly in an autonomous uh, manner. Um, so they collect very large quantities of, of data through these the sensors. And now again, by layering intelligence uh, on, on, that, uh, on, on this data and, and analyzing the data through, through those intelligent capabilities, we are able to um, uh, anticipate accidents in a sense uh, when the accident ends up happening we end up recording uh, the the data before and after and uh, so uh, the 
whether it is the insurance companies, the manufacturer, as you said, uh, the many other partners that participate in the mobility cities, uh, as another example, uh, all of these constituencies get access to uh, not only the wealth of data, but also the, 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 the results of the analysis and the insights that the AI systems can create uh, as a result of that, uh, based on that data rather. Um, we have, for example, we have a portfolio company in the UK called Humanizing Autonomy. Um, they're using computer vision and other AI uh, technologies uh, in order to be able to anticipate uh, and alert the driver if there is an impending uh, uh, danger. For example, maybe a pedestrian trying to cross the street uh, because uh, they're paying at, and, and they don't pay attention to the vehicle, but they pay attention, let's say, to their smartphone, or a bicyclist trying to cut through traffic and in this way getting in the in the path of the of the vehicle. So, so the uh, the system, the AI systems of this portfolio company is able to analyze the data that is collected from the vehicle's sensors and alert the driver that uh, something is about to, uh, to occur if they don't pay attention. So um, obviously insurance companies can benefit from that, uh, from that type of insight as well. Understood. So, you know, you mentioned municipalities, which we should talk about. There, there is a world, of course, I think, that you view that as these cars get more and more advanced, it may be that more and more people don't seek to have car ownership themselves, but would prefer to have either uh, ride share services with these kinds of vehicles. And like we're gonna talk about right now, municipalities. It sounds like municipalities are really interested in this, in this technology and these advances perhaps for buses, but also for cars. Yeah. So in, in the, the previous book that I wrote, the second book was called Transportation Transformation. I, um, my, my thesis and my, my work was around uh, the, how three constituencies, um, cities, uh, mobility services companies, and automakers need to collaborate in order to, uh, to help urban mobility. And uh, cities, uh, particularly after the pandemic, have become uh, increasingly interested in how transportation changes because of the different habits that uh, people get. And, and these habits may be the result of uh, concern about the environment, maybe the result of uh, different uh, uh, work practices. So we, we have, for example, fewer days at, at work and working from home. Um, we have um, the, the so-called uh, donut cities, so urban design, where people stay more on the periphery of the city, in suburbs, as opposed to uh, going to the, to the city center. So there are, there are different reasons why uh, new mobility patterns are emerging. Um, as part of these new mobility patterns, we're seeing multimodal mobility uh, becoming more prevalent. So people, for example, um, uh, using, as you said, a ride hailing service to go part of the for part of their trip, uh, changing then maybe to public transportation, let's say a train, uh, and then doing some walking at, at the other end at their destination. So as this multimodal uh, mobility patterns emerge, uh, cities uh, are starting to exhibit, I would say particularly cities outside of the US, are starting to rethink um, how to uh, restructure their, their, their transportation, your public transportation in particular, and how to serve their, their citizens uh, better. And, and again, in, in doing that, uh, they recognize that data is an important ingredient, not the only ingredient, but an important ingredient 
uh, in uh, for for helping them create the, these new plans. Maybe create new routes. Maybe create offer new modalities. Uh, we we've, we've helped here a city in in the Bay Area, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, design a new autonomous mo modality uh, for a rel for relatively short distance travel. Um, so so again, th there are. Um, Data and AI can can play a big role here, and, and the cities are starting to recognize that and take advantage of it. The, the center that I'm on the advisory board, the the C2 Smart Center, uh, the Department of Transportation C2 Smart Center is spending, it's focusing exclusively on this idea of how the city uh, needs to to change and what they need to do, where they need to collect data from, what data they need to make available to other constituencies how they need to rethink scheduled transportation versus on-demand transportation in order to not only better serve their citizens, but also accomplish other goals such as uh, climate, uh, climate goals, uh, equity goals, and, and the like. I, and I could see how this could be so exciting for them, not just because of fads, and tourism or what have you, but traffic congestion, maybe evaluating whether very large buses with fixed routes are the way to go, or they should be supplemented with smaller van type things with custom made routes or side routes. Again, all, all you in equity, uh, congestion and cost, all potentially making the cities much more livable and much more sustainable. Exactly. And, and in fact, we're seeing in some cities, even here in the U.S., the, uh, uh, the analysis to determine whether they can, they can use smaller, smaller vehicles, uh, use more on-demand transportation as opposed to schedule. Because we have, we're seeing periods where you have these large 45 passenger buses that they, they run empty. Uh, and, and that's not good for, I mean, especially as uh, cities around the world remain relatively cash strapped um, and they try to, to, uh, to, to better utilize their budgets, um, having, making this kind of analysis and, and taking these steps is particularly important. Okay. So let's talk about um, other uses than just consumers. We, we obviously have a very vibrant trucking industry and logistics industry in the United States. Where do you see this developing when it comes to shipping logistics, particularly when it comes to vehicles? So um, logistics companies have been some of the more advanced users of, uh, of AI and data and AI. And as you said a minute ago, uh, this is because it's a lot of money changes hands and then this is a big industry. So they're trying to, um, so automation, optimization, uh, various type of other kinds of analyses uh, have a direct impact, impact on the bottom line. And again, I will say that um, companies like Federal Express, uh, Amazon, uh, UPS have been extremely good demonstrators of, of what the proper use of data and AI can, uh, how it can impact, positively impact their, uh, their business. So now as we, what we have seen over the past, um, I don't know, five, six years is the emergence of, of urban um, uh, mobility services that relate to goods delivery. So if you think of companies like Instacart, for example, or Uber Eats, um, they are where, where you're using now um, uh, both the, the vehicles, but also on the back end, the, the software and the combined with the, with the right data to tell you uh, where to deliver, when to, to pick up, when to deliver, uh, how to deliver it in order to, to optimize results, where to park, um, you know, which door to, to knock in a sense. Um, and we're seeing uh, three classes of uh, vehicles and maybe three classes of services deliver, uh, emerging through that. 
um, we're seeing the, uh, the, the, the short haul uh, uh, delivery, which could be uh, on, the, on the street or it can be on the sidewalk. So there are companies, for example, that provide uh, the so-called sidewalk robotics that, that are used for delivery. Um, we're, we're seeing the emergence of the, the so-called middle mile delivery, which is what happens from the, uh, the data, from the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the warehouse or the distribution center to the store. And then obviously the long haul delivery, which is distribution center to distribution center. Um, so in all of these three types of delivery, we're seeing a lot of innovation. And we're seeing innovation both on the vehicle side. So think of, for example, companies like Neuro that have a completely new form factor of a robotic vehicle for delivery of particularly groceries, but eventually other, other goods as well. Um, we have, as I said, the, the sidewalk um, uh, robotics, which are much smaller vehicles that uh, operate on the on the sidewalk and they can operate autonomously and then we have the the long haul tracking which again to date we, we're seeing we're in advanced trials um, and we're seeing uh, a, a number of companies uh, testing particularly in, in southern us and in china and, and a little bit in europe uh, testing the distribution center to distribution center uh, delivery um, or on that maybe port of origin to a distribution center. Um, in that latter scenario, in this sort of phase where we are not having fully autonomous vehicles, I could see the safety challenge. You, you know, if, if, Am if an Amazon driver now is using robotic sticks or however somebody is controlling the vehicle and they've got 15 or 20 stops, you know, and it's an hour, the ability to focus and maintain your concentration just to see what's going on seems like that would be easier than somebody who is controlling a truck that's going from Los Angeles to Oklahoma City where they could be on the road for many many hours and again when these are fully autonomous vehicles that may be less of a challenge but I would imagine for now the long haul might have its unique challenges that others might not have. Yeah, long haul, we're seeing uh, a couple of uh, big challenges. The first one is um, uh, we, we have a tremendous deficit of new drivers. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, demanding lifestyle to, be, to take these long trips. Uh, younger people uh, are not attracted to the, to the profession for obvious reasons. And when we talk to tracking companies, they say they can find drivers um, that, that work eight hours a day and then they go home at night. Uh, they cannot find as many drivers as they used to who are willing to spend, say, two, three days a week on the road. Um, so the, the emergence, particularly of autonomous uh, long-haul trucks, um, is expected when, uh, to, to fill that, that kind of need because that need exists not only here in the US, but we're seeing it, um, we're seeing it globally. Um, the second problem, though, is for the, for the drivers um, who, or for the people who, who do become long-haul drivers, um, having vehicles that can make them feel safer while they're driving, right, because of these uh, uh, levels of driving automation that they exhibit is, is also a big win, right? Because you, you realize that you can, you can complete your, your trip uh, safely and get to your destination without delay, which, which again, in the logistics industry, that's a big deal. And that, that makes sense. Thanks for tuning in. If you want more info on the show, please visit blockandtackleshow.com. And you can also email me at carl at blockandtackleshow.com. Thanks for tuning in.